Um, today's speaker um, is known uh, to the Jewish community here in Oklahoma very for a long time and with great affection. Professor uh, Lisa Wolf is the uh, endowed professor of Hebrew Bible uh, at uh, OCU. Uh, and uh, she's been uh, teaching at OCU since 2007 after having completed degrees in psychology, Hebrew Bible, ministry at uh, UC Boulder, United, United Theological Seminary, uh, the Wesley Foundation, and uh, over the years in uh, uh, Oklahoma, I know firsthand she's had an enormous impact on uh, students and colleagues uh, in the area of Hebrew Bible. When people say, ask me, you know, biblical grammar question, uh, which does happen, um, I say, well, let me ask Lisa. And, uh, and that's exactly what I do. Professor Wolf has published uh, in a wide variety of media, a DVD Bible series, uh, Uppity Women of the Bible, a companion book to that series, Ruth Esther, Song of Songs and Judith. Uh, other works, including, uh, there really, there are quite, quite a lot, so I'm not gonna mention them all. She wrote 30 entries for the New Interpreter's Dictionary of the Bible, which is really quite astonishing. NIDB, uh, if you really need to look something up, uh, the, uh, the new, new Interpreter's Dictionary is just wonderful. She's worked on innovative uh, uh, projects educationally with uh, students uh, using Dead Sea Scroll material, actual Dead Sea Scroll material uh, when it was uh, here in Oklahoma. I don't know if it's still housed here or not. Um, and uh, very recently, um, she is, um, uh, just about to finish, and maybe by the time I finish this introduction, she will have finished. That's how uh, productive she is. Uh, a commentary on the book of Ecclesiastes, aka Kohelet, for liturgical presses, wisdom commentary series. Uh, she's a wonderful teacher, a wonderful colleague, and uh, we're awfully glad that she agreed to come down from the city um, today. And uh, here's Professor Lisa Wolf. Thank you, Dr. Levinson. And yes, I will clarify, uh, I obviously need to update my online bio because the Kohelet commentary came out at a really great time. It was the second week of March, 2020. So there went that book signing, right? Uh, yes. So you will hear about Kohelet today, which is one of my favorite things to talk about. I sneak it into everything I possibly can. But thank you for your welcome, your hospitality to Dr. Levinson and uh, the faculty here and students and the whole Schusterman Center. Uh, I am so grateful for the collegiality over the years. My topic today, Childist Biblical Interpretation, invites us to seek out the children of the biblical world, primarily through ancient texts, but also informed by re relevant material culture and comparative ethnography. So I'd like to get started just by doing some group brainstorming. This is the group participation part. And I was hoping you would help me name some biblical stories or passages that include children? What comes to mind? Isaac and Jacob, good, in, in Genesis, great. Uh, and yeah, hard to know their ages. I would have to look and see the words referred to, but we do get to meet, um, especially Isaac as a, as a child, yeah. Yes, for sure. A father-son dynamic, too. Yeah, go ahead. Good. David and Goliath, where David was a, a, a child or a youth. Again, I'll get to the vocabulary in a bit. Yeah. Hagar, as a child. Okay, good. Hagar and Ishmael's child. Hagar's child, Ishmael. Yes, good. Yes. Go ahead. Yes. 
Asav and yes, his loss of the firstborn rights. Right. The father and son relationship again, also the privilege of the firstborn son as important, especially in the Torah is, is definitely an issue for a uh, child of biblical studies. Other ideas you can think of? Ephraim and Manasseh. Okay, good. Yeah, get in the back, Trice. Zoom contributes Moses. Really good. Very good. And um, for those who branch out into the New Testament texts, of course, Matthew plays with that a lot in telling, in his version of telling about uh, Jesus. So yes, Moses as a child, really important. There are actually a lot of children in Exodus chapter one. Great. Okay. The women who were brought to King David, and especially in the context of the Me Too movement, how old were they? Were they underage? Really good questions. And this is where childish biblical interpretation and feminist interpretation intersect. Um, and again, there, as I've said before, oh gosh, we have to check the text and see what terminology does it use? What hints does it give us? And of course, we have to recognize that our contemporary definitions of a child are probably different than those in the ancient world. So uh, good job on the audience participation. That was a good start. Oh, you have another one? <laughs> they get mauled by the bear. <laughs> Uh, and um, my my colleague Russ Dalton at Bright Divinity School in Texas has done some work on how that story has been. Oh, I know you. Hi. <laughs> has done some work on how that um, was included in children's Bibles uh, over the years. I know, I know. Yes, exactly. That's the right reaction. Um, <laughs> but it wasn't always the reaction. It was it was seen as a, a really helpful story to keep kids in line and morality trail tale, absolutely right. So the, the field of childish biblical interpretation has been gaining steam for several decades. After appearing in the 1960s, it took off in the 1990s and has been growing exponentially since that time. Now on this slide I, and the next, I provide some pictures of some of the authors and titles that are prominent in this area. So you can see some uh, author names that are important in this field, Sharon Betsworth, Julie Faith Parker, Dana Nolan Fuel, Christine Garraway, Sean Flynn, and again, Julie Faith Parker, and then uh, Laurel Cup Taylor. Naomi Steinberg, Cornelia Horn, and John Martins, and uh, Marsha Bungie. And those are some of the central names. Now you notice, uh, and I'm not just being humble here, but my name is not on those slides. So uh, it's not my central area of work, but I have taken some forays into childish uh, biblical interpretation, and that's what I hope to uh, present today. Um, I also have, there's some great online annotated bibliographies that Oxford has. If you just uh, search on Oxford annotated bibliographies, you'll find one by Julie Faith Parker, Children in the Hebrew Bible, and then one, The Bible and Children by Radar Asgard. And another good source to um, give a little love to OCU School of Religion and our annual Newstat lectures. Last year's Newstat lectures, we brought in Dr. Christine Henriksen Garraway and her three lectures are available on YouTube. If you just go to YouTube and search Garraway, Newstat, you will find them all. And those are excellent uh, resources. So this field of study really arose, as I said, in the 1960s, but has taken off since then. And I like to use this term childist, although it is not completely agreed on by all the scholars who work in this field. This is a term that Julie Faith Parker argued for, and she has a whole section about it in her book, Valuable and Vulnerable. But Radar Asgard uses the term childish, 
And Christine Henriksen Garraway has used the term not yet adult, abbreviated NYA. I like childist as um, Parker defines it, used in specifically a positive way of looking and even advocating for the hidden children in the biblical texts and the biblical world behind those texts. Parker, Parker uses this term analogously to feminist, and she writes that a positive view of childist, quote, emphasizes children's active role in shaping culture instead of seeing them as largely passive or victimized, end quote. And she goes on to articulate the goal of this method, quote, to identify and appreciate the influence and importance of promising compelling young biblical characters, end quote. So that's her uh, definition for uh, childist. Now, one of the things we need to think about are is the terminology used in the biblical texts. And I will just um, touch on that a little bit. Uh, again, Julie Faith Parker goes into this in great detail. Uh, she starts with the Hebrew abain, usually translated son, but in its plural form, it there are places where it clearly includes girls. Beyond that, other terms include bat, daughter, achot, and ach, sister and brother, bekor, firstborn, among others. And of course, there's a whole list of Greek terms that my New Testament colleagues uh, have uh, come up with, but I will leave that to them. So a few other questions uh, to consider. Uh, besides the terminology, how would children have been affected by ancient historical events? What were the roles and status of children in the biblical world? Who are the children in the biblical texts and world as we were brainstorming? And then the thing that I really love to think about is where are the children hiding in the biblical texts? And that's a strategy I came up with in working on my Kohelet commentary. It's part of a feminist commentary series. And if you've read Kohelet, Ecclesiastes, uh, you know there aren't a lot of women in there. So I had to get a little creative in writing a feminist commentary on Kohelet. And one of my central questions, and this is a, a previous lecture I gave for this uh, series, was where are the women hiding in Kohelet? So I've done an analogous thing in working with children. So I try to go beyond looking uh, at the obvious passages that actually name children, such as Pharaoh's call for the deaths of all the Hebrew baby boys in Egypt, as someone named, uh, to, for instance, asking how biblical teachings about, say, foreigners would have affected not only the adults, but also the children in those categories. So I'm going to start by honing in on Kohelet, uh, perhaps a fitting book for the last week of the semester. Uh, maybe you want to wait and read it afterwards. It's our last week of the semester. Is it your last week? We have finals next week. Okay, yes. So um, in Kohelet, I have identified several short passages as relevant to a childist interpretation. And some of these I will spend some time on and others I will just kind of go through and they can be bonus passages that you can look at on your own later. So starting in chapter four, where an absent son serves as a placeholder in an inheritance scenario. And these are my translations. They are pretty wooden, literal interpretation translations because I really like to stick close to the um, original in, in doing this research. There is one man and not a second. He neither has a son nor a brother. Yet there is no end to all his toil. Also, his eyes are never satisfied with riches. For whom am I toiling? And who will make me lack pleasure? This also is absurdity and a terrible task. So 4.8 describes the ghost of a son, Bain, whose absence will prevent a man from passing on his wealth to anyone, thus rendering his estate and all the work that created it an absurdity. And I, I will waffle between my translation absurdity and hevel, which is the Hebrew for that term, typically has been translated vanity, uh, but I prefer the translation absurdity. 
So uh, here, the son could be a child, and of course would have been so at one point, but the relevant matter here has to do with being a placeholder, or rather not being a placeholder, for the man's hard-earned wealth in the course of its being passed down as inheritance. The term bane in this case indicates the recipient of an inheritance rather than a child per se. Notably, the term bane indicates that this ghost child is a male, and although the five sisters, Machla, Noah, Hogla, Milka, and Tirza from Numbers 26 and 37, more often associated with the name of their fathers, Lafahad, they might have had something to add about daughters inheriting. We can't be sure about Kohelet's views on that topic. Kohelet seems to imply that there might be some sense in this kind of workaholic acquisitiveness, if at least it were going to the next generation. This suggests the importance of offspring, here's the childish insight, in terms of the way they validate the hard work one put into acquiring wealth. Yet, Kohelet's questions also serve as critique, as usual. What about the possibility of enjoying one's toil at a more moderate rate, or even the possibility of enjoying children, one's own or those of others, whether or not they will be inheritors? And children as inheritors is a big theme in the passages I'm looking at today. The next one is, um, oops, I have, <laughs> I've got the wrong title on this slide, so pardon me for that. Uh, this is 413 through 16, so ignore the top line. Better is a poor but wise child than an old but foolish king who no longer knows how to heed a warning. For he came out of prison to rule, even if in his kingdom he was born poor. I saw all the living who walk around under the sun with the second child who will stand under him. There is no end to all the people, to all that were before them, although the ones coming after will not rejoice in him. This also is absurdity and a striving after wind. Now, my choppy translation of this passage, full of ambiguous reference, illustrates the obscure Hebrew in these verses. If you know much about Kohelet, this will not surprise you. As you can imagine, this leads to widely divergent translations that go to greater lengths than I did to try to make sense of this passage. Rooted in the difficult Hebrew, the exact point of these four verses is obscure. So scholars disagree about whether or not the characters are the same throughout the passage, and we wonder, based on the larger context of the book, if Kohelet really means to privilege youth, wisdom, poverty, leadership, or anything for that matter, especially once we get to the closing phrase. At least at the beginning of verse 13, a childist interpreter can find some hope in the fact that a child or youth, yeled is the Hebrew, is the better than object. Better is a poor but wise child. It's such a typical wisdom styled saying, and it's one of Kohelet's favorite aphorism styles, the better than. So it seems in this case, Kohelet's use of a child as an illustration is probably positive. I translated child for Yelad here, even though most often Yelad in this particular verse is translated youth. The more common translation youth here fits with the contextual assumption that this poor but wise child is also the one who came out of prison to rule in the next verse. Presumably someone who would be poor but wise and coming out of prison to rule would more likely be a youth than a child. Antune Scores gives that very justification for his use of youth rather than child with no further support for the argument. It seems to me that given the highly ambiguous nature of this passage, we need not assume that the opening phrase is necessarily about a young king, nor that it necessarily connects to the following verse, though even if the first verse is about a king and does, and does connect to the following verse, it could very well be about a child king rather than a youth. And this is something that did not come up in our brainstorming is the existence of kings who were children in the Bible. So uh, can anybody think of one? Josiah, age eight in Kings, uh, 2 Kings 22. And um, Thomas Kruger uh, talks about this and connects this actually with Ptolemy, King Ptolemy 5. 
uh, and I'm a little skeptical of being about being that historically definitive with any part of the Kohelet, but uh, it's an it's an interesting possibility in any case. So verses 15 and 16 seem to refer to a second child, and if that's the case, that might further emphasize Kohelet's positive view of a poor but wise child, and in particular the youthful aspect of this ruler. Another way to think of the word second in verse 15, however, is that this refers to the child ruler who supplanted the old but foolish king in verse 13. The phrase stand under him and even the reference second do seem to indicate that this child will replace someone, whether the old but foolish king in verse 13 or someone else. It seems that in any of those readings, a child leader had wisdom and a following. But after many years, the people's support of him apparently waned, according to verse 16. Whether that had to do with loss of childhood or youth or passage of time in general, Kohelet does not make clear. Nonetheless, the, same, the sage seems to create and or play with a proverb that links a child with wisdom and even royal rule, albeit also poverty, over against age and foolishness. Now, chapter five, verses 12 through 15, has another abstract placeholder, a, a son as another abstract placeholder, but I'm gonna leave that as one of your bonus passages. So if you wanna jot that down and look at it on your own later, I invite you to do so. And I am going to Skip to, there we go, 6 3. 6 3. This is, I mean, this is Kohelet. The child is dead uh, in this one. So this is a downer, just letting you know. Uh, if a man begets a hundred offspring and lives many years, however many the days of his years be, but his inner self is not sated from the good, and also he does not have a burial, I say, Better than him is a stillborn child. That's true Kohelet. A uh, child is a prop for his metaphor here. Uh, now, so I want to note that the meaning of that final Hebrew word, nephel, uh, may be closer to miscarriage, and that is how it's often translated uh, in Job, for instance, Job's, Job 3.16 and Psalm 58.9. But this verse is truly in need of a childist interpretation. So here again, we see another better than saying from Kohelet that provides an unexpected outcome. But to say a stillborn child is better than an unfulfilled man with no burial, despite his long life and many li living children, does trivialize and demean that child, not to mention their, chair their parents. And I, for one, one, am left wondering if this child had a burial. What's going on here? This is a grisly and callous kind of a verse um, insulting the painful experience of any parent who has suffered the loss of a child at birth. And data from the biblical period suggests that miscarriage and stillbirth would have been more common than it is now. But I'm hesitant to suggest that the imagery would have been any less offensive. Indeed, the shocking nature of this statement may have been precisely what was intended in Kohelet's rhetoric. Kohelet is something in, of a master of gasp-worthy, insulting comments, so it's not so surprising. But what could be easy to miss here and what I want to highlight is that in this case, a child takes the fall. Certainly, this child gets no respect as the dead ab abstraction Kohelet uses for the sake of making a point of all things about enjoying life. All right, another uh, bonus passage that I'm going to skip here, 10, 16 through 17, another child king. And then I'm going to move to 11, 9 through 12, 1, which is the closing poem of the book prior to the epilogue. Rejoice, young man, in your childhood and let your heart make you glad in the days of your youth. And walk in the days of your heart and in the sight of your eyes and know that over all these, God will bring you into judgment. Remove anger from your heart and expel evil from your body. 
for childhood and youthfulness are hevel or absurdity. Remember your creator in the days of your youth before the days of misery come and years draw near when you will say, I have no pleasure in them. This lovely little two verse saying in 11, nine through 10 enlists an inclusio with the word ha yal dut, which I, sorry, I should have increased that font for myself, which I translated childhood, not so much because it is a precise translation, but because it provides some contrast with the other plentiful terms in the passage that relate to a life stage preceding adulthood. So the root in this term, yalad, is common enough in referring to children, but the use of it here and in the next verse to refer to a stage of life is nearly unique in the biblical text. Only appears elsewhere in Psalm 110, verse 3. Thus, this term and the verse hold something of a special place in childist studies for their identification of childhood. Now, verse 9a includes a repetition of a bahur, or young man, though we have not really gotten to meet this young man. He simply serves as an audience for Kohelet so that we readers can hear what Kohelet has to say. Perhaps this makes the young man yet another placeholder for Kohelet's purposes. At the end of verse 10, we get a hapax, a word that appears only once in the biblical text, root, which I have translated youthfulness. It has been proposed as, every, as referring to desire, dawn, and even blackness, perhaps indicating the black hair of youthfulness as opposed to gray hair. And I would add, if this black hair translation is correct, it also reminds us that the paintings of supposedly biblical blonde-haired children that I grew up seeing in church are historically problematic. In the end, pairing this hapax with hayaldut supports its translation as referring to youthfulness. Now, ordinarily, I would have set 12.1 off into the next pericope, but for the sake of this particular study, I will treat it with the preceding two verses. In 12.1, Kohelet uses the term uh, bechorot for youth. And Julie Faith Parker indicates this term also refers to a stage in life, this time older childhood or even young adulthood. Since this verse opens a longer passage that laments the difficulties of old age, the point in using this term is to contrast youth with a time that Kohelet describes as the days of misery, which entail no pleasure. In this case, there is little doubt that Kohelet privileges youth over advanced age largely for reasons of declining physicality. Still, Kohelet has not substantively explored the time of life that is youth, so much as used it as a foil for old age. And as we read in 11.10, childhood and youthfulness are hevel. So it is difficult to see them too positively. Now, maybe that term in this place has more the sense of fleeting here than in the other 37 places in the book. But in my view, the overall use of the term Hevel is fairly negative in Kohelet, so that slightly undermines any positive sense Kohelet might be giving to youth here. I'm going to move now away from Kohelet, much as I would like to always say in that book, to, uh, oh, there's a little summary, sorry. Uh, and of course I didn't go over all of them, but the, uh, if we were to do the math here, um, we don't necessarily get a positive view of children from the way that Kohelet uses them in the language from that book. So I'm going to move to a uh, recent um, project I've been working on related to a statement in Ruth 4.15 and Samuel 1, 1 Samuel 1, 8, that I have turned, termed more to you than X sons about the most math that I'm going to do. And this is a statement that's made uh, to Naomi by the women of Bethlehem at the end of Ruth and a statement made by Elkanah to Hannah at the beginning of Samuel. And my question here has been, 
what can we learn from this ancient idiom about the value of children in the biblical world? And I like to think of this uh, as a riddle. So here's the riddle. What's worth more? 10 children, seven children, 10 sons, seven sons, a widowed Moabite daughter-in-law, or a wealthy biblical patriarch with two wives, one of whom has children with him. So we'll, we'll get to all those details. So Ruth has the phrase, more to you than seven sons. Oh, yikes, the Hebrew font um, is interesting there. Okay, so the phrase uh, there is, um, uh, for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who gave birth to him, she is more to you than seven sons. And in 1 Samuel, while that was a complete fail, uh, my translation, <laughs> wow. Uh, Elkanah says to Hannah, who wants to have children, and he already has children with his other wife, Penina, and he's trying to comfort her. And he says, he asks her this rhetorical question, am I not more to you than 10 sons? So the similarity of these phrases suggests a pre-existing idiom, the more to you than X sons. And the phrase uses children as a point of comparison to express the value and importance of an adult. So this ancient expression inspired me to explore several questions. What can these strangely similar phrases add to our knowledge about the role and value of children in the biblical world? Do the greatly varying contexts of these phrases provide any insight to that question? Because the rhetorical settings of these equation-like sayings highlight Elkanah and Ruth rather than the hypothetical children they mention, those children hide in plain sight. I want to search out those children in various ways, in practical terms relating to whether this number of births was realistic in the biblical world, in economic terms, including their value as family inheritors, and finally, in relational terms, given the particular context in which each phrase appears. At the end of the book of Ruth, after Ruth has given birth to Obed, is where we find this, uh, this earlier phrase, for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who gave birth to him, that's Obed, she is more to you than seven sons. And then... Uh, we get the passage in uh, Samuel as well. And spoiler alert, in case you forgot, uh, at the end of chapter one in First Samuel, Hannah does conceive and bear a son who is the namesake of the book in which we hear this story. And after uh, Samuel is born and Hannah offers him to, for a life of service at the Shiloh temple. She gives a praise filled prayer in chapter two. And in verse five of that prayer, she states a barren woman bears seven. So there's another use of that uh, term of, of the number seven that we find in Ruth, not in Samuel, but it seems um, uh, curious in any case. It's a notable point of comparison and contrast with Hannah's own so story and links to Ruth. Now, elsewhere in the Hebrew Bible, we find several other occasions where seven children appear, often, interpret often interpreted as an ideal. For instance, Jeremiah 15, 9 refers to she who has born seven, while Job 1, 2 and 42, 13 refer to seven sons and three daughters. And these instances may offer us adjacent information about the value of children as found in Hebrew idioms, along with the fact that the number seven, to hone in on that, as Professor Livesey helped me think about uh, recently, uh, is a significant number across cultures, certainly in the Hebrew Bible. So there, there's something going on there that is symbolic beyond the literal. But I want to go back to the literal for a minute. So practical matters here. On a biological level, these phrases raise problematic practical issues. The scholar Jenny Ebling, who's an archeologist, especially of women in the ancient world, she cites data showing that, quote, the average lifespan of an ancient Israelite woman was about 30 years. She adds that men in the same time period had a lifespan about 10 years longer. 
the dangers of childbearing in the ancient world would account, at least in part, for this difference in lifespan. Furthermore, Ebling explains that, quote, in the Eastern Mediterranean world during the Iron Age, only 1.9 children survived out of the average 4.1 births per female. 4.1 births shows you that math people did that, not women giving birth. But anyway, uh, this is coupled with an insight from Christine Hendricks and Garraway about delayed pregnancy due to sustained breastfeeding of women in the ancient world to conclude that the ancient, ancient women would rarely have produced seven or more total offspring with some variation due to the quite common occurrences of miscarriages, stillbirths, or early childhood deaths. In regard to those circumstances, Carol Myers has estimated that, quote, only half the children born in early Israel lived to the age of five. Furthermore, if banim in each phrase literally indicates sons rather than offspring, then the total number of births for a mother of either seven or 10 would have to have been quite a bit higher than seven or 10 to allow for the birth of daughters in between the sons. However, as I mentioned earlier, Julie Faith Parker observes that daughters are sometimes included in the collective banim. Now, it is theoretically possible, of course, that a woman would have only sons, but the rarity of that scenario, as well as the unlikelihood of such a high number of births of any gender for any ancient woman, lead me to the genre conclusion that these parallel phrases function more as unattainable ideals and thus serve as hyperbole, whether the X in my phrase equals seven or 10 whether they are boys or girls or both. And this would particularly be the case if the seven children or sons were from one mother, as it seems to be the indication in these contexts, as opposed to they're all belonging to one father, who might, of course, have had more than one wife. For instance, the phrases in 1 Samuel 5, the baron has borne seven, and Jeremiah 15, 9, she who has borne seven, in which the subjects are both women, would be hyperbole. And in contrast, the references in Job don't mention the mothers. So, you know, maybe Job had another wife that the narrator just doesn't tell us about when it mentions uh, seven sons and three daughters. Uh, you know, women have been hiding before. We've seen that happen. Uh, so, and as for seven versus 10, this is, again, where we need to start thinking about the importance of symbolic numbers, uh, such as seven um, in the Hebrew Bible and across uh, cultures, both in the ancient world and even until today. Now, biblical children as uh, economically valuable is the next place I want to turn. And many scholars in childish biblical stu studies have pointed to the economic value of children in the biblical world. Julie Faith Parker, Laurel Cup Taylor, Naomi Steinberg, Christine Hendricks, and Garraway. And of course, if it were not for the value of children and especially sons, the more to you than X sons phrases would have no meaning. The equation-like statements only work rhetorically because of the assumption that a full to bursting quiver to quote, uh, paraphrase Psalm 127 was indeed quite valuable. So the very use of children in these parallel idioms illustrates the great value of children in the biblical world. This is in contrast to today's world, where often people think of children as an economic liability instead of an asset. If we put together the insight that the idiom's rhetorical context relies on the value of children in the biblical world, along with the point that those children specifically had economic value, then more than X sons actually commodifies the children to which it re is refers. And this supports the arguments of, about the economic value of children in the biblical world. So given what we do know about the various ways in which children were economically valuable in the biblical world, what might seven or 10 sons have been worth to Hannah or Naomi? Now for Hannah, the concern probably would not have been about passing on inheritance as we saw was so important to Kohelet since her husband already had other sons, but that was an issue for Ruth 
which indicates the sale of land belonging to Naomi through Elimelech, which if purchased would be acquired along with Ruth, the Moabite, uh, the widow of the dead man. And that's in Ruth 4, 5. But another issue for a woman in the ancient world is the value of a child for establishing her social legitimacy, especially if she is childless and widowed. So the stories of Tamar in Genesis 38 and Naomi and Ruth illustrate that a woman, a widow without her own sons would have been exceptionally vulnerable in this cultural context. And perhaps that was on Hannah's mind that her only safety net was Elkanah. And when we know what we know about lifespan in the ancient world, that may have seemed to put her in a very precarious uh, position, perhaps especially if he was advanced in age. While Elkanah did not have to worry about who would inherit for him or who would take care of him due to his children through his other wife, Penina, Hannah could not share that security. So 10 sons for her would have been akin to additional wives for him. And for Naomi, seven sons would have provided her with extra and more conventional Goel insurance, the Goel being the redeemer, the helper, the one who was supposed to uh, help a family member in the ancient world out of financial, legal, or other trouble, usually the next eldest male relative. Another genre-related option br brings us to the legal realm. In a 1990 article, Raymond Westbrook discovered a parallel for the number 10 in Elkanah's statement, more to you than 10 sons. Westbrook investigated adoption contracts from the old Babylonian period in which a son was brought into a family that had no sons of their own in order for that son to be their heir. Like we see in the story of Abram and his designated heir, Eliezer of Damascus, a couple with no sons would sometimes adopt an inheritor to address the dilemma of not having an heir. Westbrook found six nearly identical examples in which the number 10 was used to prevent the adoptive parents from severing ties with this adopted son as their principal heir by stating the adopted would remain the principal even if the parents were to have 10 sons. So the existence of these repeated, con uh, of more than one of these contracts suggests that these situations did sometimes arise in which an adopted inheritor was supplanted by later born natural sons. Presumably the point was to protect the adopted son and to prevent disputes by potential sons in the future. These contracts point to the value of children, particularly sons as inheritors, in which case the eldest son had the utmost value even if he was adopted. And Westbrook proposes that Elkanah's phrase, more to you than 10 sons in 1 Samuel 5, was a point of comparison with these old Babylonian adoption contracts. Now, my last uh, category is relational value, but I'm not going to say a whole lot about that because I do want to uh, leave a little bit of time for questions. But one of the interesting aspects here is that in both of these passages, Ruth 4, 15 and first, or, or Ruth 4 and um, 1 Samuel 1, we get the uh, the word ahav for love as part of the conversation with uh, and about Ruth and Hannah. So Elkanah says that he loves Hannah and uh, the women of Bethlehem tell Naomi that Ruth loves her. And this use of the word ahav in those contexts indicates the value of the children used in that terrible, parallel phrase. So both Elkanah, uh, so those lines involving love, that for Hannah and that for Naomi, um, suggest the relational value of those children. And the biblical saying, more to you than X sons, that we see in these two passages, indicates the commodification of children, so their economic value affirming what we already have seen in the childish biblical studies literature. So this just kind of adds to that um, conclusion. These passages help us view how, how children, and especially sons, functioned as inheritors. They provided widows with social legitimacy. They served as potential providers and caregivers for their mothers. 
and they even secured all of Israel's future through the Davidic line, an uh, insight that um, Naomi Steinberg provided about uh, Hannah's gift of Samuel to the temple in reforming the priestly system and setting the stage for both monarchic and prophetic traditions. In addition to these roles of economic value for children in the biblical world, in the narrative context of Samuel and Ruth, the rhetorical use of this phrase also paradoxically expresses the relational value of children as the phrase appears as an interpersonal plea amid scenes expressing love rather than a solely legal assertion of wealth or lineage. So whether Kohelet's abstract placeholder or even dead children or those hypothetical idiomatic seven or 10 sons or children in Ruth and Samuel we do get a glimpse of the ways in which children were valued in the biblical world. We see their roles as inheritors, as leaders, as legitimators. We learn of their value both economically and relationally. The audiences of Ruth, Samuel, and Kohelet must have found children important in, other, in order for them to show up in these passages. And surely we should do no less in considering the worth of biblical children. Perhaps these explorations of children in the biblical world can additionally inspire us to consider the worth of today's children, whose worth similarly varies depending on where they live, who is talking about them or caring for them, and how much our own culture values them. Thank you. So we have a little time for okay. questions. Oh, I, yeah, go ahead, take it away. I guess I can MC, but can I also ask a, a question? Yeah. Um, I was, uh, I'm, it's a quite, it's a, an observation leading to a question. In First Samuel, you have the very touching portrayal of Hannah after she gives birth to Samuel, waiting to wean him until she brings him up to Shiloh. And then the, I think, remarkably extraneous but not extraneous detail that she comes up every year to bring him a new coat, which uh, leads me to my question, which is it seems like a lot of the examples are really of childhood are really centered around either infancy, like the Moses, little baby Moses in the uh, in, in the ark, or um, uh, the child who dies from Bathsheba and David's first uh, uh, and incest, you know, adulterous relationship, or it centers around childhood centers around either infancy or late adolescence. So, for instance, Joseph was seventeen years old described as a not R. And, um, you know, obviously in, uh, in 1 Samuel 17, David doesn't go out to battle when he's Goliath when he's four. He must be something, you know, like a late teen. So I'm wondering, I guess it's a kind of a challenge question. It's like, isn't childhood, aren't really most of these narratives either late adolescence or infancy? Um. Yeah, I mean, that's a really, I, of course, I want to hedge on answering that question because without really having a good command of every one of those stories, you know, I hate to make a generalization, but I think it's a really interesting observation. The thing it, it, it leads me to is the difficulty of defining childhood and even the question about can we, are these comparable categories. So there's some really interesting scholarship, both within biblical studies and in anthropology and in developmental psychology about what is the definition of childhood throughout history? When did that get defined? And, um, and of course, if, you know, if a woman's life expectancy was 30 years and a man's was maybe 40, um, you know, you're going to be thrust into what we would think of as adult responsibilities pretty early on. Uh, and, and that, that would seem to be the case. So, I mean, even to think of, of, of Joseph as, as 17 years, um, uh, we were just reading that in my Hebrew class. Um, 
that seems kind of old to me, actually, in the context, right? But that's the, that's one of the interesting dilemmas. But one thing I love about it is that it's one more of so many reminders that when we read the biblical text through our, our, our contemporary lenses, we bring assumptions to that that may not be remotely accurate. And that's a good one. You know, we think about a teenager or a child and we bring a whole bunch of assumptions with that that may not be relevant at all. Thank you. Uh, Zoom, if you have any questions, go ahead and speak up. We will not be able to see you, but we should oh, be able I to see. hear you. They have the chat, I think. Oh, they were more, they were from our brainstorming. Oh. Uh, <clears throat> when I was a college student many years ago, there was a, uh, we were taught um, about a book by uh, Philippe Arias called Centuries of Childhood. Since you didn't mention it, I assume that that theory has, has uh, passed away. But uh, at, the, at the time, the, the insight was that uh, childhood, a modern concept of childhood was actually an invention of the modern world. And it didn't exist in the past. Although, as I recall, the examples were sort of were medieval and so on and not biblical. Um, is there a characterization of childhood as a social category in the biblical world? Uh, or let's say, not so much in the biblical world, because I think you explained that well, but in the world in which the people who wrote and read the Bible live. So he does appear in the literature. Uh, a number of the scholars who I named on my early slides, especially Julie Faith Parker spends a long time talking about his theories. And you are right, to some extent, his theories have been supplanted by newer scholars. Um, and I am not gonna try to summarize that discussion right now. Uh, because that's just not something I've spent enough time in. But I think I think that um, it just points to my previous comment, really, that we cannot assume that our contemporary categories are equivalent to those in the ancient world. And the way that we would assume you treat a child is the way that you would have treated a child in the ancient world. And we can even see that through eth ethnographic studies, that the way children are treated in other cultures today it varies from one place to another. Uh, thank you for fascinating uh, talk. And uh, I was wondering, like, as you went through the phase of the close reading, it seemed that the automatic placeholder, at least from what we saw, was a boy. Um, and I was wondering if, based on the research that you saw, when daughters are mentioned, usually the relationship as it's their importance is either because they're loved or they can bear children while boys have importance as inheritance and they have other functions. I was just thinking of that because you said that it's important to contextualize that at the, at the time. So I was wondering if there was any insight into that, if anyone did analysis of how daughters versus sons were mentioned. I'm so glad you mentioned that. Um another place where childist and feminists really intersect. So, I mean, if, if we just read Genesis, for instance, on its own, I mean, I think it would be easy to conclude that all that matters is a boy as a, a firstborn boy before, uh, except that always gets messed up in Genesis repeatedly, uh, is really the important thing. But there are so many places uh, in, um, even in the Torah, like Exodus, uh, there's, of course, Pharaoh thinks that he can eliminate his problem by getting rid of all of the baby boys. But then, then the narrator repeatedly emphasizes, but let the girls live, let the girls live, let the girls live. And then there's this irony, of course, that Pharaoh thinks he can get rid of his problem by getting rid of all the baby boys. And he is foiled by girls, including his own daughter. So uh, Moses's sister, the midwives, the um, Moses's mother, uh, so, uh, and then I also mentioned the passage in Numbers, the two times in Numbers that Machlanoah Hoglamilka Tirza 
uh, the daughters of Zalafa had are mentioned. Um, and then they are mentioned uh, also, they come up again in uh, Joshua, I think. Um, and so I think even though it, it could seem easy to, to make a generalization about the importance of a firstborn son, and yes, that is important, but I think there's a lot of um, reading against the grain we can do in terms of seeing the very prominent passages about daughters. Uh, and that has been some of the work of Childish Biblical Studies is looking at daughters. Um, and my, my colleague, Sharon Betsworth, uh, who, who used to be at OCU, uh, has done a lot of work on daughters in the New Testament and the emphasis on their, them in that literature. So I think that is another place to really pay attention. Um, I love the idea that we m might learn so much and maybe we're, uh, maybe it's intentional that we learn a great deal from the, the sort of the more subtle implicit storylines than we do from the big overarching ones. So, and, and to me that points to that idea. Oh. I think that would be just the absolute right place to say uh, thank you uh, to Professor Lisa Wolf for coming and sharing her most recent research with us. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, everybody have a wonderful uh, uh, winter holidays and uh, look forward to seeing you in the spring. Take care. <laughs>